Babies, how are we doing? Welcome to our next video lesson on sound. Today we're actually going to get into a lot of meat and potatoes on some of the special phenomena with sound and where sound, I guess, becomes unique in terms of a type of wave. And what we're going to re kind of relate to um, is what we talked about in our basic unit of waves of interference. So remember, interference is when two waves are interacting with each other within the same medium. So we looked at, for example, the interference of transverse waves where we would have crests meeting crests or troughs meeting troughs or potentially a crest uh, meeting a trough. And we talked about two types of interference patterns, what was called constructive and destructive interference. Um, so constructive is when they were always the same phase. So whether it was two crests or two troughs meeting together, but anytime they were the same phase, they followed what's called the superposition principle, where the amplitude of each wave would simply add together to form a resulting wave that is equal to the sum of both those amplitudes. So for example, both these amplitudes are one, so the resulting wave would have an amplitude of two. Same thing here, this would be negative one, so they would have a resulting amplitude of negative two. And here we would have destructive interference, which was the second type of interference we looked at, where you would have a crest and a trough meeting together where they would be the opposite phase. Uh, in this case, based on the superposition principle, if I had a positive one amplitude and a negative one, well, those two numbers would add to zero. So what ends up happening is the amplitude gets smaller. So in terms of sound waves, sound waves, because they are waves, can interfere constructively and destructively. Uh, just to kind of give you guys a little simulation here, you can see, imagine now instead of crests and troughs, remember we have compressions and rarefactions, I'm sorry. Compressions are the particles of the medium when they're very close together, and rarefactions are when they're spread out. And again, this is because sound waves move differently. If I have, let's say, particles within a medium, if the wave is traveling from left to right, these little particles are going to vibrate back and forth within the medium. And anytime you have all those particles near each other, again, you're going to have those compressions, which you'll see in this little simulation, and the rarefactions where they're spread out. So notice sound waves can interfere constructively and destructively as well. Just like we talked about when we see two sound waves, or two regular waves, where we had two crests meeting each other, here when we see two compressions, you will see kind of the darker spots. So again, when two compressions meet up, they'll form a more intensified compression. When we would see two rarefactions meet up, it would be a more intensified rarefaction, meaning less particles in that space. Um, and then the same thing would be true with destructive interference. If at any point they would meet out of phase, so a compression would meet a rarefaction, it would essentially cancel each other out, and there would be no compression or rarefaction at that point. It would just be at its regular position. So sound waves can interfere constructively and destructively. Now, what might this look like? So take um, constructive interference, for example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a sound for you. This is going to be a sound. Uh, it's 440 hertz. Okay, might be a little bit annoying, but just listen to the sound. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play another sound with the same exact frequency so they are perfectly in phase and listen to what happens. Okay, so again, listen to what happens when I play the second sound. Okay, so when you hear the first sound, again, you can hear that frequency, but when I started to play a sound of the same frequency, you can kind of still hear that undertone, but at the same time, you'll notice that the sound got louder, that if we have constructive interference, you're going to hear a more intensified sound. So think of like the decibels is going to increase. Now, destructive interference is hard for me to simulate to you guys in a video lesson, but Destructive interference can occur. It's when sound waves completely cancel each other out. So an application of destructive interference might be, for example, like anytime you hear like noise canceling headphones, okay? What happens there is what they're doing is those headphones are technically generating a sound wave that is going to eliminate some of the noise that would be heard outside of those headphones. So it uses a sound wave to destruct any sort of noise that's outside while it doesn't affect anything inside the headphone. So again, sound waves act just like transverse waves in that they can interfere constructively or destructively. Now another special um, phenomenon that occurs 
is when sound waves interfere, but they don't interfere perfectly, okay? Meaning that you don't get perfect constructive interference where you don't get perfect destructive interference, so something in between. So imagine, for example, you have the red and the blue wave. So let's say that I have the blue wave meeting here, and then the red wave kind of, oopsies, that's not red, but the red wave kind of, they don't meet perfectly in phase. So where I have my crest right here, the crest here might be shifted. So they're a little bit out of phase. What happens anytime sound waves are a little bit out of phase, they create what's called a beat. Okay, now a beat, essentially you can see this here in green. You have the red wave and the blue wave, not perfectly in phase. There are positions along this path where you see constructive interference and positions where you see destructive interference. And notice the green pattern down here. What ends up ha happening is they form a resulting wave that has a very small frequency. And you have the points here of constructive interference and the points here of destructive interference. Now, I want you guys to listen to this. I'm going to play a frequency of 440 hertz, and then I'm going to play a frequency of 442 hertz. Okay, so let me write those down. 440 hertz compared to 442 hertz. And I want you to listen to what it sounds like. So here we go, 440. And now I'm going to add in 442. I'm going to stop those both. Now, as you heard that, hopefully you guys didn't think it was pretty obvious. You would hear the wah, 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 wah. Then you heard it go loud and soft, loud and soft. But that altering between loud and soft, that was occurring at this frequency here. And it just so happens that the beat pattern that you see is just simply the difference. 442 minus 440 would give you a beat pattern of 2 hertz, okay? So for example, if I were to play 440 again, but now instead of 442, let's say I play 444. I'm going to increase it just slightly. Notice how the frequency gets bigger. I'll go up to 445, 446, 47, 448, And again, going louder and louder. So that is what's called a beat frequency. Is anytime two sound waves don't interfere perfectly in phase. If you ever hear that phenomenon where sound goes wah, 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 that's called a beat frequency. All right, a unique phenomenon that occurs when two sound waves interfere is what's called resonance. Okay, resonance is what really is the foundation to musical instruments, and it's an application of constructive and destructive interference. So what resonance is, is it looks at another property of an object called a natural frequency. And again, any sort of wave is created by a disturbance. So let's say, for example, I were to drop a wrench, okay? If I were to drop a wrench, when that wrench hits the ground, it's going to make a noise. Now, if I drop, let's say, a PVC pipe and it hits the ground, it's going to make a noise. Anytime I, like, let's say drop any object or disturb an object, that object is naturally going to make a noise. And based on its properties, it's going to naturally vibrate at a specific frequency. That frequency is what's known as the natural frequency. So all objects will have a natural frequency. For example, and I showed you guys this video before, but let's say then that I had guitar strings. Okay, And again, guitar strings are different widths, different lengths, different stiffness to it, uh, different tension things we talked about before. But again, as you'll see here, the fingers plucking the strings, notice the different frequencies. But fantastic. We can notice right here, you can see the different wavelengths, different frequencies. But the idea is, is that each of those strings, when disturbed by plucking them, are going to naturally vibrate. Now, how does this produce sound? Okay, this is where the idea of resonance comes into play. Is that we design instruments such that we create vibrations that then affect the medium through. So, for example, 
a guitar string, what we are doing is plucking a string. Now that string is not actually the thing that's making the noise. What ends up making a noise, and take for example an acoustic guitar, is we are specifically using the wooden part of this guitar. An acoustic guitar is designed to follow the property of resonance. So what resonance is, is that when I force a vibration, and a force vibration would be, for example, when I pluck a string. What happens when I force a vibration, sometimes it will match the natural frequency of an object. Meaning, when I pluck the string, it's going to make the air inside of this chamber, as well as the wood itself, everything is going to vibrate. And what happens is it amplifies the sound. You get a more intense sound. So resonance is any time a vibration or a disturbance matches the natural frequency of an object and what you get is an ampli amplification of that energy. Good example for resonance would be like a, a swing. A lot of you guys have been on a swing. So imagine sitting on a swing by yourself and you want to go further up on the swing. All of you at some point have probably learned to pump your legs as you're going through that swing. So what you're doing is you're forcing a vibration to match the motion of your swing and that results to you going to greater heights, okay? So again, the idea of resonance is to match the natural frequency of an object, which is then going to intensify the amplitude and the amount of energy that's placed into it. This is seen, this is one of the primary things within music, but this is also seen in everyday life, okay? I talked about dropping a wrench or on a swing set of dropping a PVC pipe. We get those things to vibrate. Well, heck, this is a video that shows the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940. It's so a bridge that spanned the Tacoma Narrows in, in Washington. Uh, what happened on a very windy day is that the wind actually match the natural frequency of the bridge. The bridge is made out of concrete and steel. You'll see here it's swaying back and forth. But from my understanding, concrete and steel don't do that. So it just so happens that the wind matched the natural frequency of that bridge causing it to do that. Okay, next video, this is something you guys might have seen before. It's actually something I filmed. Uh, what I did is just filled up a wine glass full of water. Uh, and if you just dip your finger in the water and then you know, rubbed your finger around the edge, the rim of the glass, what you'll do is because of friction between your finger and the rim of the glass is you'll actually create a sound. But what ends up happening is that the vibration of that friction between your finger and the rim actually matches the natural frequency of the glass as well as the air column between the water and the rim. It actually causes an intensified sound. So give this a listen. Now what I'll do here is I'll take a drink of water so that the water level goes down. I want you to notice how it changes in terms of sound. Notice the higher frequency. So I'm going to take another big gulp. And again, notice the change in sound. Mmm, delicious. How neat is that? I think one more time here, folks. Mmm, thirsty. So again, what happened there is that the natural frequency, I guess the force vibration of my finger on the rim was matching the natural frequency of the glass, causing that air column to vibrate and notice that we got different uh, sounds. And the thing to compare then is that obviously we have sound being produced in this air column and how that compares to sound being placed on a string. You'll notice that as the water level went down, we had higher frequency. But again, what we're looking at here is interference of sound based on natural objects. All right, now our goal again is to kind of look at how interference relates to real life. So those of you that play music and understand things about uh, sound and music and all that should hopefully start to understand some of the things we've been talking about. So when we look at, for example, like just interference in general, constructive or destructive interference, when we look at the beat frequencies um, versus the resonance that occur, 
all those are kind of foundations to music. One of the other things we talked about were the idea of standing waves and harmonics. We looked at that in our last unit on, on waves. Harmonics, again, are any time we have standing waves. So, for example, you know, our first standing wave is when we had two nodes and an antinode in between. And then when we add a node in the middle and continue to add nodes, we get different standing waves that occur at different frequencies. Well, those are known, again, as harmonics. In music, harmonics are also known as octaves. Um, and I want to just kind of show you guys kind of where all this comes from is here I have a piano. In a piano, we have different notes going all the way from A to G. Okay, now why do we call harmonics octave is because when we look at the different notes we can play, I want you to notice and if we count, here's A, so think of this as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So notice that those two A notes are eight keys technically apart. Okay, we have the one in the first key and then the eighth key. So they're literally eight spaces apart in terms of our notes. Hence why we have octaves. Oct is a prefix for eighths. Now why we have an A here and an A here and an A here and an A here is that those represent the different harmonics. If I were to play this for you guys, okay, the first A note, if I were to play that, notice the low frequency. Now if I play the next one, You'll notice that the frequency gets higher. First standing wave, second standing wave, third standing wave, and fourth. First harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. We do the same thing with the B. B, again, eight keys apart. B, B. So again, our harmonics are just the different standing waves that are representing those different notes. And then again, where that word octaves come from is basically how far away those keys are from each other. In terms of the frequencies, again, when we play these different things together, for an octave, you're always going to have a frequency that's a whole number of whatever that harmonic is. So for example, if this was 40 hertz, the next one would be 80, and then it'd be 120, and so on and so on, that the frequency of those harmonics or those octaves are always going to be whole number integers of whatever that fundamental frequency is, Okay. Now, there are other relationships that we have in music. Obviously, we don't just play a single note. I'm not just going to play one key, but instead I'm going to play keys together. So, for example, I'll just touch random, okay? And you can hear how those two keys might actually sound good. So when I play different chords or different things like that, that there are different frequencies that actually sound good. And there's actually a mathematical relationship between some of these so for example, there is what's called a fifth, okay? And a fifth, the way I like to look at it is the kind of the black keys. Notice that you have a pattern of two, three, two, three, two, three. It's kind of unique that two and three, what do those add up to? Well, they add up to five. So a fifth is any time you have a ratio between the frequencies of three to two. So for example, I'll just pick a simple one. You could have a relationship of 300, 300, sorry, 300 hertz to 200 hertz. That would simplify down to a three to two relationship, okay? Those on a piano might be seen as the black keys on top. So for example, if I play the one here, okay, between the C and the D, that's called the C sharp or the D flat. Now, if I were to count five keys over to here, sorry again, notice that I will have C sharp, D flat, C sharp, D flat. And again, if I go five keys over, C sharp, D flat. Notice the different frequencies. So it's interesting how you get these different mathematical patterns between the frequencies of different sounds we can play. And this is how we get into like the foundations of music theory. So for those of you that might have studied that or know that, okay, that's kind of where all this is founded. Now there are sounds again that sound good and there could be frequencies that don't sound good. So things that sound good is what's called consonants, okay? Those are sounds that actually sound pleasant to the ear. But then there's also some sounds that do not sound good together. That's called dissonance, okay? And that's any two sounds that would not have something good. So they would follow like a random pattern here, like 37 to 20 is a ratio of their frequencies, okay? So for example, they might have a frequency pattern of 370 hertz as a ratio to 200 hertz, okay? So those two sounds, if we were to play them together, probably wouldn't sound good. Can I show it to you? Grab a listen. Here's 370 hertz. And here's 200 hertz. 
and there's a fire truck, folks. Okay, so again, you're going to have different frequencies rep representing different sounds, and there's blends of how those sounds will actually sound pleasant to the ear. Okay, so what we talked about last unit was the idea of standing waves. We focused primarily on standing waves of strings and how that was a, a phenomenon of interference where things were timed up perfectly. And again, for standing waves, what I would see is that wave kind of fluctuating between crest and trough, but things are timed up perfectly where all it does is it appears that as if the wave is standing still and not moving forward. And again, you get that altering between crest and trough. And this is, again, sets the foundation for what we just talked about, the idea of harmonics and octaves. That the first standing wave, also known as the first harmonic, would be when I would have, for example, just altering between a crest and a trough. You have two nodes at either ends of the string and an anti-node. You would have the same thing when, I, again, I would add a node in to get to the second harmonic. And then the third harmonic would be the same thing, add an additional node. And what you get are kind of those loops, the fluctuation of those anti-notes. But this is the foundation of all sound and music as well. So again, kind of relating everything, if I were to pluck a string, it's going to vibrate at a certain frequency based on that standing wave. So it's going to vibrate at a specific harmonic and say it's a, an acoustic guitar. That vibration might then cause the air inside that acoustic guitar to vibrate and resonate at a more intense sound. All right, so what we're going to look at next is the idea of standing waves in air columns. So we looked at the idea of standing waves in strings. So think of that as relating to guitars or a violin or anything that has a string to it. Uh, we could produce standing waves in percussion instruments like drums. Now that's a little bit more difficult for, under, for us to understand at this point. What we're going to do is look at some of the other types of instruments. So for those of you that know the instruments, you have like the brass, which is like the, the trombone, tuba, things like that. You have the woodwinds, like the clarinet, that have like a reed. Um, and really breaks down into different types. And the physics behind it is all about the air column. Okay, So all those types of instruments, take for example a flute. A flute is essentially... An air column. What you have here is the the hole in which you that you blow kind of across, called the embouchure, if you will. So you blow air across, and that air vibrates, and that vibration travels all the way down the tube. And what you get is that property of resonance, where you're going to get an intensified sound. And depending on the keys, and the keys, all it's going to do is change the length of the air column inside, and that's going to create different notes. And essentially, what happens is it creates different standing waves. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into two types, standing waves and air columns that are open at both ends and ones that are closed at both ends. So for example, a flute would be one where it's open at closed ends. Open, sorry, opened at both ends. Here you have the opening that you would blow across and then you have the open end there. So what you're getting is a standing wave pattern that occurs between two open ends. Now a way to think about an open end is that the air particles at those ends are able to vibrate back and forth. They are free to move, which means we're going to treat those, I'll write as AN, as two antinodes. Okay? And depending on the key that we might press, we would add different antinodes and nodes inside. So in an open end, what we have is we have an antinode at either end of that air column. Now, what we should hopefully remember from last unit is that between every anti-node, I should have a node. So what happens, and what we're going to do instead of viewing this as a compression and mirror faction, I'm actually going to draw this as a transverse wave so it's easy for us to visualize. So we can think of an anti-node as a crest or a trough, so I'll draw it as a crest. The node is at rest position, so if I start from up here, it's going to go down through. Now, it can't go back up, but it's going to go down to the bottom like that. Okay, I could have started from the, sorry, the trough and gone up and through and gone up to there as well. So it could have looked either way, but this is essentially what a standing wave is going to look like inside. Now we're viewing it as a transverse wave. That's just going to help us to relate it back to what we talked about in our last unit with just regular transverse waves. But the idea is then is that between, in each of these columns, between every anti-node, you're always going to have a node. Okay. So what that's going to produce then is it's going to produce um, 
different harmonics and different frequencies at which we're going to create standing waves. So this very first standing wave that I drew based on the anti-nodes at either end because of the open ends, this is technically the first harmonic. So in this case, in an open air column, you would have for the first harmonic two anti-nodes at either end and a node in the middle. There's always going to be a node between every anti-node. Okay. Now again, harmonics occur at specific frequencies and if you remember there's that relationship between speed of a wave frequency and wavelength and you can see here every see the wave if we think about in terms of the wavelength we have here just the top part and the bottom part a complete wave would be a total crest plus a total trough so what i'm seeing here is just the back half of that crest and the front half of that trough so if I think of how much of a wave I have here, think of I have that chunk, here's my middle, here's that chunk. So what I have here is technically think of this as a fourth, whoopsies, a fourth, a fourth, a fourth, and a fourth. So since I have two fourths, I technically have here half a wavelength, okay? So within that one air column, I have a half a wavelength. So my first harmonic would occur there. So if I were to draw this out again, for my first harmonic, I would have two anti-nodes at either ends, and what I would have then is a node in the middle. So then my first standing wave would go anti-node, node, anti-node. Anti and again, I'll draw it below so you can see kind of both ends. Now, that's our first standing wave, which again is going to have that within that length, you're going to have a half a wavelength, okay? Now, if I were to draw the next standing wave, again, for an open air column, I'm going to have an anti-node, sorry, at either end. Now, the way to think about an open air column is that if I want the next standing wave, I'm going to add another anti-node in the middle. Now, this is different than we talked about strings because strings, we are adding nodes. Now, we're adding anti-nodes. But between every anti-node, there's always going to be a node, okay? So that means my second standing wave would start here. It would go through the node, up to the top to an anti-node, back down through the node, and into here. And again, I started from a trough, so if I were to draw the other end, it would look something like this. Now in terms of this wave, I have here my full crest, and then I have two quarters here. So within this length, I have one full wavelength. Okay, now in terms of the harmonics, again, this was the first harmonic, this is the second harmonic. Okay, so we can relate that idea of the number of harmonics to the length. And in this last one, again, I'm going to have my two anti-nodes at either end, but now I'm going to try and squeeze two more anti-nodes inside. I always add an anti-node, which means that between every anti-node, I'm going to add a node. So this wave start at the top would go through down then up and through and like that doesn't look the prettiest but it looks something like this now in terms again of the wavelength okay this is a little bit trickier to understand again but you have here one complete wave and then you have a quarter here and a quarter here so technically you have one and a half waves so within this length you have one and a half, which I'm going to write as three over two. Because what we talked about is that within that length of a string, the relationship between the harmonic and the wavelength would be n over two times whatever that wavelength is. And again, that's going to tell you the harmonic. And again, this last one I forgot to write down would be our third harmonic. Okay, so this would be the relationship we can look at between the length of that open air column, I think I just said string, and the wavelength that we would have. And again, each of these would occur at different frequencies. So this looks a little bit different than what we talked about last time because we're not starting with two nodes or starting with two anti-nodes. All right, now we're gonna go through some examples. The first one we're gonna do is identify the harmonic. And all this is, is I like to do it as counting loops, okay? This is kind of the best way to do it. So when we count a loop, think of a loop as, when we looked at last unit, a node to node with an anti-node in the middle, okay? Now, for the first harmonic, we should have one loop. For the second harmonic, we should have two loops, and so on and so on, okay? So if we were to identify these patterns, notice here how this, we don't have nodes at either end, but we have anti-nodes. But if we think about the amount of a loop, 
I want you to notice that this is technically half a loop and the other side is also half a loop. Well, two halves means that technically we have one loop, which means that this right here would be the first harmonic, okay? If I were to continue, I have here a half plus one plus a half. So let me just write this out. So a half plus one plus a half. Well, that would give me two complete loops, even though I can't see it, which means this would be technically the second harmonic. So if I were to continue this trend, I'll just do one more for you guys. Half, one, two, another half. So I have two in the middle and then two halves. So this would technically be the third harmonic. And this would be the fourth, fifth, sixth, and we can continue on to whatever harmonic we look at. So you have your complete loops again. So again, you count the complete loops that you have, and then you have two half loops at the end. In total, they have to add up to whatever harmonic we're at. So in terms of the frequency, we can just simply identify it based on the loops. Now another trick that also people like to look at is, this kind of relates back to what we talked about in our last unit, is that when we look at the specific harmonic, that the number of nodes also represents which harmonic we're on. So you notice the first harmonic has one node, second harmonic has two nodes, then we have three nodes, and four nodes, and so on and so on. So this is a way in which we can then recognize it based on the frequency. So for example, if I have here a frequency of 80 hertz, sorry, I want to highlight that, and let's say that that's the fundamental frequency, that's the first standing wave, which in a open end air column would look something like this. Again, it's going to be two antinodes at either end with a node in the middle. So what we have here is we're going to draw the wave pattern for a frequency of 400 hertz. And I want to identify which standing wave pattern would that be. Okay, so the standing wave pattern, again, is going to be based upon the frequencies. So if I have here a frequency of 400 hertz, compare that to the original fundamental frequency of 80 hertz, divide those two out, you would get five, which means we're going to be on the fifth standing wave. So the fifth standing wave means we're going to have four loops and then two half loops at either ends. So again, we're always going to have our two antinodes at either end. Okay, so an antinode here and here. And then we need nodes in the middle. Now what we talked about in the previous slide is that the number of nodes is going to equal the harmonic we're at. So if I'm on the fifth harmonic, that means that within this air column, I want one, two, three, four, five nodes. And then again, between every node, you have an antinode. So I'd have an antinode, 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 and then this one should be down there, not up top. Okay, so if I were to draw this out for you guys, I would start from my antinode, which is the open end, go through, and then I'm going to fluctuate up and down again through there. And again, I could start from the bottom, but you would see it looking like that. So in terms of, again, the loops, I would have one, two, three, four loops, and then two half loops at either end for my fifth harmonic. All right, our next example, there's a little typo, folks. It does say 60 here. This I wanted to change. Forgot about that. We're going to change that to 100 hertz. But again, we're going to compare the fundamental frequency of that air column to its new frequency for that standing wave pattern. So here we have the fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. That's that first standing wave. And I want to know what does the standing wave pattern look like at 300 hertz. So if I just take 300 and divide it out by 100, I'm going to get 3, which means I have the third harmonic. Any standing wave in an open air column is always going to have two antinodes at either end. And again, it could be a crest or a trough or a compression rarefaction, I should say, uh, which means then we're going to have nodes in the middle. Because we're on the third harmonic, we should always have an equal number of nodes to the harmonic we're at. All right, which means I'm going to go from antinode through the node down here, then back up and down and into there. Okay, so again, I need an antinode between every node that I would have. And again, if I were to draw it the opposite direction, I have that. So in counting loops again, I would have one loop, two loop, and then two halves at the end for a total of three loops. So this, again, is just identifying what the wave pattern looks like based on its frequency. All right, this last one, we're going to look at the relationship between the wavelength and the length of string to identify the standing wave pattern. This one is a little bit trickier to understand again. And what we looked at is that within the length of string, 
it always had the relationship of n over 2 times the wavelength, where n represents the harmonic we're at. So to kind of understand the harmonic, what we're going to do is look at the relationship we did last chapter, last unit, I should say, where the harmonic we're at is going to follow this relationship. It's always 2 times the length divided by our wavelength. Okay, this, so this is the relationship we're going to use if we want to relate it to the harmonic based on the length and the wavelength. So for example, in this one, we have a length of the air column, which is 48 centimeters, and the wavelength is 96. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 2 times the length, which is 48, and I'm going to divide it by the wavelength, which is 96. So 2 times 48 would give you 96. Divide that by 96, you get 1. That means when we get 1, we should see the first harmonic. So the first harmonic, again, open air column, we're going to have an antinode at either end, and we're going to have one node in the middle. So if I were to start from, let's say, a crust, I would go through that node and then to a trough. And again, if I were to start here from a trough, go through the node up to a crest. So that would be my first standing wave. Second example here, again, I'm going to look at my length of 48, my wavelength of 24. So if I want to find the harmonic, I'm going to take 2 times the length, so 2 times 48 again, and now compare that to the wavelength 24. So 2 times 48 again is 96. Divide that by 24, and you're going to get 4. So that means we have the fourth harmonic. Now what does that look like again? This is the difficult thing in drawing, is I would have two antinodes at either end. Oops. And then the number of nodes is always going to be equal to whatever harmonic we're at. So I would have four nodes. So between every node, and this might help to draw it out, let's say I start up top, I would go down to here, I would need an antinode in between, and then back up through. I would need an antinode in between, go back down, antinode back up to my antinode. Okay, and I'm at the end. That one didn't look as pretty, but I'll try and draw nice and smooth. Looks something like that. And again, to count the number of loops, I have one loop, two loop, three loop, and then my two halves would give me four loops. So that is for an open air column, looking at the pattern based on the frequency and the wavelength. All right, last thing here, folks. I know we're getting a little lengthy here. But this is the last meat and potatoes. So we looked at open air column. For those of you that play instruments, you might play something like a woodwind instrument or that maybe requires the use, instead of an embouchure, might use what's called a reed, where, uh-oh, a reed is technically a closed end. But even though it's a closed end, we still over here have an open end. So you might have, instead of two open ends, you might have a closed end and an open end within an air column. The only difference between this is that instead of having a node, sorry, instead of having two antinodes, here you would have a node at the closed end and an antinode at the open end. So in terms of my air column, I would have node here and antinode. Now the tricky part about this is that you always want a node followed by an antinode. So here, there would not be an antinode in between them, nor would there be a node in between them. So my wave would start at the rest position and go to a displacement. So it would look something like whoop. Or if I draw below, something like whoop, like that. Now the tricky part about this is that if I think of a complete wave and think of that rest position, all I have right now is from a node to an antinode. So I only have this chunk of the wave. So understand being shown right here is only a quarter of the wave. So within this length of tube, I have a quarter of the wavelength. All right, now this first one where I have a node and an antinode, this is technically the very first harmonic. That's the first standing wave I can draw. That's the first harmonic. So again, the relationship is that within that length of string, I would have one fourth of the wavelength, like how I used that little mark there to represent a one, that was pretty neat. Okay, again, that is because I had node and an antinode. Now, for every other standing wave, and again, this is gonna look at the harmonics, I'm always gonna have a node at the closed end and an antinode at the open end. When I wanna draw the next standing wave, I'm gonna fit a node in here as well as another antinode. 
okay? And the way this would look is go from node to antinode to node to antinode. Same thing if I were to go down to an antinode, through the node, and then up to that point there. Now again, what we're going to try and do is represent what or how much of a wave that we have at this specific frequency. And again, this is occurring at a certain frequency. So to compare this to the diagram down here, notice I had, to, first of all, my first one I had a quarter wave. But now here I have a, a loop plus all the way down to an antinode. So I would have the entire loop plus down to an antinode. So I would have this much of the wave from there. So if I count this, think of this again as quarters. So I would have one quarter, so one fourth, another fourth, and another fourth. So what I have here is technically within this length of tube is I have three fourths of a wavelength. Now on the next standing wave, again, if I were to follow this pattern node, and at the end I would have an antinode, if I want to do the next standing wave, I now have to go from one node in the middle to now two nodes. So I gotta have two nodes within that tube, again, not counting that one that's automatically at the end. So that means I would need antinode in between, so I would have to go up to the antinode, through the node, then back down to the antinode, then through the node, and back up to the antinode. And the same thing here would be down, up, and through, and it looks something like that. So if I were to count waves here, notice that I have up and down, so that's a complete wave, plus that quarter. So I have one complete wave and then a quarter. So to kind of relate that to fourths, I have one complete wave would be four fourths, plus a fourth would give me five-fourths. So I have here five-fourths of the wavelength. Now what's interesting about these closed end air columns is the pattern it follows. Notice here that I go from node to antinode. I have a quarter of a wavelength. Then I go right away to three-quarters of a wavelength. Well what happened to, think about a quarter to three-quarters, what happened to the halves? Right? What happened to half a wavelength? What happened to a full wavelength? Notice I'm skipping those even numbers. And that is because in a closed air column, you do not have the even harmonics. This is the first harmonic, okay, the fundamental, if you will. This is technically the third harmonic, and then this is the fifth harmonic. So for a closed end air column, you will only have the odd number harmonics. We actually skip the even number harmonics. And that's what makes these a little bit different, okay? So in terms of the types of sounds we can create from this instrument, we don't have the flexibility that we would have from an opened end air column. Okay, so now what we're gonna do in our first example like before is identify the harmonic, okay? So just know that in an air column where you're closed at one end, you have a node at one end where it's closed, you're always gonna have your node. Okay, so notice all of these waves start off with nodes. Fantastic. But at the either uh, sorry, the opposite end, you're going to need an antinode. Okay? So because here we have a quarter of a wave, this is technically going to be the first harmonic. Now the second one, notice I go here. This is kind of what I was talking about. I go from node, antinode, node. Well, here's the thing. Because this is an open end, this has to be an antinode. So this cannot happen. Now, this is technically a half a wave. So this would be the second harmonic, but this is not a thing. So the second harmonic does not exist in a column closed at one end. Now, again, to follow the pattern, this would be the third harmonic. And notice we have our antinode at one end. All right. Next one, we have here a node, but notice we have a node at the open end. That cannot be possible. So our fourth harmonic does not exist. Continuing on, this would be our fifth harmonic. And then this last one, notice and this actually works. I have my node here and I have an antinode all the way over here. So how do I identify which harmonic this is going to be? The way I like to do this is to count fourths, okay? So a whole wave would be crest plus trough. So if I were to cut this wave into a fourth, all right, this would be my half a wave. So if I cut that half in half, a fourth would look like this. So it's gonna look, from a node to an antinode. So from a node to an antinode represents a fourth of a wave, okay? 
So if I were to count, I'll go on this last wave here. I would go from one up to here. So I'll just mark these. That's a fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths, five fourths, six fourths, seven fourths. So because this is seven fourths, that number seven is going to tell me which harmonic we are on. So this would represent technically the seventh harmonic. A little bit sassier with these closed air columns. All right, in this next example, we're gonna again relate the frequency here, okay? Now it's gonna be the same kind of thing we did before. You have your fundamental frequency, which is 100 hertz, your new frequency, which is 500 hertz. So we're gonna compare these, but again, you're only gonna see here odd number uh, frequency. So we have 500 divided by 100 to give me five. That means we have the fifth harmonic. So I'm sorry, odd number harmonics. So again, to draw this out or identify, I would have my node naturally at the closed end, my anti-node at the open end, and what I need is five fourths. So I'll start from my node. I would go up from node to anti-node. That's one fourth. Back to node, two fourths. Anti-node, three fourths. Node, four fourths. Anti-node, five fourths. So if I were to draw this out, it would go up down and through and there. So I gotta count the fourths. And if I were to draw the other way, it would look something like this. So that would be my fifth harmonic, okay? Counting fourths of a wave. All right, now last example, baby shoddies. But what we've been looking at again is that relationship between you know, the nodes and antinodes and which harmonic we're at. So how do we relate this to length and wavelength that we've talked about? So we've been looking at the idea of fourths. So you have n over 4 times whatever the wavelength is. But know in this case that n can only be odd numbers. So 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on and so on. Now, because we're cutting things in the fourths, and how this is different from an open air column, is that if I want to find the harmonic we're at, we're not going to double the length, but we're going to do 4 times the length divided by the wavelength. So this is the equation or relationship we'd use to find the harmonic we're at. So in this case, if my length is 48 centimeters and my wavelength is 96, I would do 4 times 48 and divide whatever that is by 96. So multiplying 4 times 48, I would get 192. Divide that by 96, I'm going to get 2, which means this should be the second harmonic. Now the second harmonic, when we have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other, again, we talked about that this would only occur at an odd number. So is it possible to have a second harmonic? So understand that this is not possible. Now to draw it for you why it wouldn't be possible is that if it is the second harmonic, okay, second harmonic means that we need two fourths. Two fourths, same thing as saying half a wave. So a half a wave would look something like this, okay? Draw it there, boom. Now why this is not possible is because when I draw a half a wave, Notice at this end I have a node. And because it's an open end, that is not a thing. That is not possible. Okay? So this is what it would look like, although it's not possible to have that second harmonic. All right, a lot of meat and potatoes. I apologize for the longer video, but a lot of interesting things when we look at sound interference. Okay, good luck on those concept builders, and we'll see you next time, folks.